Okay, it's time to begin. Um, looks like most people are here. And as I sent email this afternoon, I did post a new lecture notes. I posted your exam. Um, and I also finally graded assignment one. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, any questions before we start? Uh, okay, um, in that case. So I have um, document 20. Um, so I'll start talking about an issue we talked about a little bit before on assignment one, which is going to be something important we, you talk about. Um, you know, we've all written code before, and I suspect most of us, when we start writing code, we always think, oh, this is going to work, right? Um, and we, we assume it's correct, and we run, oh, it doesn't work. You know, we, fix, we create a fix for it. Now it's going to work. And then, no, oh, sometimes it does, but a lot of times it's like, oh, don't know. Um, and so we go through this iteration over and over again. But finally, we get rid of all the bugs or errors we can find, and then we move on. And let me uh, get a slide. Fine. Okay. All right. And so often, very frequently, we're writing code. We assume it works, and we find it doesn't. Our assumption isn't quite correct. Um, and we go through this iteration and we, we debug it, find, the, find our errors, correct them, and move on, right? And do this over and over and over again. Um, so the problem now is in big data or data science, um, 
we're not writing an application where we can check and say, okay, are the windows in the right spot? Are the buttons in the right spot? We're writing code, which can analyze data and come hopefully find something interesting or come to some conclusion. Um, but the problem becomes um, when you've got megabytes or terabytes or gigabytes or whatever amount of data, how do we know that our code is doing the right thing? Um, and so what I have here, right, is the data file that I would use to um, try and see what's going wrong with some, some of your code or assignment for question number four. Um, and it just has four rows, right? Just four rows. Um, and what I did is I said, what are the common cases we should check for? Well, um, you know, this one is, when did it start? When did it end? Well, I'm going to start to very, as early as possible in an hour and end as late as possible in an hour. And that should count as an hour. Um, another case is, like I start at 1.59 and I end at 2.01, just going barely over that boundary, right? The hour boundary. Um, and that should count for two hours. Um, and then, you know, the third case is again, just spanning multiple hours. Make sure you can do more than just one hour spanning. Um, and then finally, you know, just the real tricky situation is I'm going to start, you know, the last night of January um, at some time, and then I'm going to go for into the next year. I went for basically just over a month, because now it's over a month, um, and that's it. And I can compute the answer by hand, right? Um, so I look for what are the cases that I should worry about. Um, hopefully I found all the tricky ones. Um, and I can compute the answer by hand. And so now when I run my code, one, it runs fast. Um, you probably noticed even in assignment one that some of your code took a while to run. And that sort of annoying when you're trying to figure what's going on and I get to wait and wait and wait and like well, what do I do? Um run fast. I knew what the answer was. Um and so we can validate um our code make sure it's doing what we think it's gonna be doing. Okay. Um yeah so it says You know, Johnson's Law, where he, this is Ralph Johnson, the gang of four fame, who been promoting this is like, if you don't test it, just assume it doesn't work, right? Um, now, how we test things in software engineering might be slightly different than how we test things in um, data science. We still want to validate our code to make sure it's doing what we think it's doing. Um, you know, and the standard answer is what should we test? Well, test with the things that could break. Um, and, you know, here's a good, let's see, I'm not um, this sort of good rule of thumb is like, look at your dad, look at your what you're doing, you know, there's usually some easy case, but then it's like, okay, where do we tend to get things wrong? Well, um, you know, we all get this off by one there, right? Where do we start our loop? Where do we end our loop? We start at one, we start at zero. So any sort of range you've got, so you want to look at just 
one side of the range, the other side of the range, um, you know, on the boundary. Um, and that's what I was looking for. This, what happens if, you know, we start at the beginning of the hour, go on to the end of the hour. Um, one thing I didn't try is what happens if I start in the middle hour and then a minute later I stop, would that work? But I also wanted to do, so at the very end of an hour and go just over the hour boundary, make sure that works, go over several hours, go over several months. Um, and again, this is, you know, it comes from the software engineering um, testing world. Um, you know, Brian Merrick is a tester I want once met. And what he said is all testers keep a catalog of things that they find people tend to get wrong frequently. Um, and he says, yeah, it's very common when you're dealing with strings. We often forget about the empty string. Right, people think of okay, this string is going to contain a city name, so now I'm going to use that to do something else. But we don't think about oh, what happens if somehow that, that name is empty? Um, collections again, empty collection. Um, what happens when there are one element, there are duplicate elements? What's the maximum size? What happens when we get that bit, you know, something close to maximum size? But again, it still boils down to you know, what are the boundary points, right? An empty string is one boundary point, the maximum size string is another boundary point. An empty collections are in range. Um, but these sort of things you want to think about when you're creating sort of test cases for your code. Um, you know, and when you're building an application, we might have you know formal testing framework to use so we can you know create test cases. Um, in data science created create some test test um, input so you can validate your code, make sure it's doing what you think it's doing. And that's in the beginning, often um, what we think it's doing um, is not exactly what it is doing, right? I mean. We've all had that experience for why is my code doing what I expect it to do. Like I said, here it is, right? My test code. Um, I want to check, you know, the boundary points for when it starts and stops. Um, Starting at the very end of an hour, going just slightly over. Um, would your code count that as a one hour or count both hours? Um, and again, multiple hours. And then, you know, just going across this boundary point of one end of the month into another month, going from one end of the year to next year. Um, okay, any questions so far? Lost my chat window. There we go. Yeah, I was a little busy before I started class, but I didn't up on my windows, I need to look at all the waiting room, the chat room. And one person Nguyen said he couldn't hear me. Can you hear me now? Are you still here? You know, normally when I grade assignments, I like to spend some time looking at things we can improve upon. Um, I didn't do that as much this time. On assignment one, most people did pretty good on everything except for that problem four. 
that's where lots of people um, made mistakes. And it was somewhat difficult to figure out what was going on. Um, so here's, you know, one piece of code I came across and it's like, oh, let's see, return day. Um, day is not defined. Um, you know, luckily they never recalled that function, but you know, this is a problem if we're careful with Python because it's, what can I say? It doesn't check your, I mean, you declare variables dynamically. Um, and so they copy and paste it in another function and that function, they forgot to change the um, turn value. And, you know, here's a function they copied from and in you know, the name says string today. Okay, that makes sense. And you pass in a date. Um, and then you call two splits. And it says it's a day. And I'm going, what, what is that day? And he's like, I don't know what that is. I was trying to figure out why the code wasn't working right. Um, so I had to, well, actually, I just pass in a date object or date and then figure what came out returned. Um, and really what's going on is when I create these functions, particularly when we've got a dynamic language like Python, um, you know, what is this date? Is it a date object? In this case, it's a date string. Um, and they were assuming it was a certain um, format. So I like to say, here's, here's an example of the format I expect it to be. Um, and what does it return? Is it actually returning a list of three strings, um, the year, month, and day. Um, and so now I know immediately what's type input it's going to have, what type it's going to return, and we can make that explicit by, instead of saying day here, it's, and once we have this doc string, um, well, we can get rid of that intermediate step of storing it in the variable, um, so I can just return it. But then they have this um, day conversion function, which takes a year, month, day, and it's like, oh, wait. Yeah, so what they're doing is they're taking that crazy output of the previous function and then converting it into a date object and turning a date object. Um, and then what they really want to do is call this function and give it a start date and end date, converts convert those things to the day objects, uh, but their string today returned that crazy format, and then they had to convert it, and then they do the end date and convert that too, and then they can do what they want is take the difference. Um, so this crazy year, month, date is sort of a transient thing they really don't want. Um, you know, a slight more organized way of look, okay, I've got that crazy convert function. Um, and then my string to day function, um, now instead of doing this, we can keep that function. We don't need this temporary variable, right? Um, and then my string to date, again, oh, is it time stamp string? Do that crazy conversion in here. So returns the data object 
And so the outside world doesn't have to know about this, the temporary steps, right? We don't want that result, so don't call to this function, don't have to know, I have to then convert that to something more reasonable. And then our diff day um, becomes much simpler. Okay, so it's just um, oh, then we had this. So the diff data now returns a difference object. Um, but how do we get that out of it? So what they did is they converted it to a string and then they can split off the top part or part of it. Um, and so you know, if the days are actually different, then in return how many day, the dates. Um, but the problem is if the two days were the same, um, that function returned this crazy result, which meant later on they had to, the function had to then look at the output and the output was a single string like this that convert to integer and deal with it if it was a time like this, they would then have to um, assume do a special check for it. It's like, um, so the, the call the call this got very complicated because they had to worry about these different cases coming from the fact that they converted this difference to a um, to a string. And then they check the two cases, and in both cases, they have to convert it back to an actual number. And what they really wanted is just how many days that difference is contained, and there was a way of getting that. Um, so if you ever find yourself in a situation where you want to take a, a data and convert it to a string so you can extract information out of it and then convert that back into data. Um, you really want to avoid doing that if at all possible because you're just creating a lot of work for yourself. Um, you might lose data. Um, it's just doing that should be your last resort. Um, there's no other way of doing it. Um, then go ahead. But in this case, you have to be able to look up that data object, difference object. And but this function becomes smaller. Um, and the code that used it became much, much smaller. Collapse all cases, you got rid of two cases. You have to be actually convert those strings back to numbers. Um, and now, yeah, when I look at this difference between these two days, I get zero instead of the crazy hour, crazy time. And they're they're actually integers, which it, which is what they actually wanted. Uh, yes. Um, there's nothing like telling the grader that, oh, there's something wrong with this code. Um, uh, 
you know, when you're dealing with, um, get these warnings, right? Um, and they come with this nice little pink color um, in, in the notebook. That's a warning, you should be doing something differently. And you should pay attention to those warnings. Um, why? Well, because they're telling you something. Uh, one example, one student had a warning um, that they're apparently using a slightly different version of either Python or the library that I was using. And in my library, it changed from a warning to an error. And so to actually run their code, I either had to roll back those versions or modify their code to fix the problem. Um, so you really don't want to be turning in assignments um, with these new warnings. I don't know about you, but I, I just, it's really hard for me to read the plot that goes the wrong way, right? Unless there's just a standard format and it's like, what's going on here? Um, you know, this or the line version of, is much easier to read when you rotate the axis. Um, So far, so good. Mm. Those are the comments I have about your assignment. Uh, you can download your grade assignment um, on the course portal. And I tried to um, indicate what your points are and why. Um, I'd be careful because you have to remember to hit the save button, otherwise it doesn't update it. And when you go through about 50 of them, you start getting this routine you forget. Um, but I think I got everyone. So I want to go on to uh, another topic related to big data um, <clears throat> and first sort of what's the problem um, so we're all used to you know having sort of a, a web server talking to the database and so there's a connection between the web server and database no problem um, and now when we get more and more clients right what do we do? Well, at some point, we need to replicate our database. Now we got multiple databases and we've got clients talking to them. Okay, we can handle that. Um, and now what happens is, you know, you get more complicated. There's a billing system, an inventory system, right, a tracking and shipping system. And they're reading data from databases to figure out what's an inventory, um, you know, shipping things, tracking where they are. Um, so now the communication is starting more and more complicated, right? Um, because now we've got all this going on and all, all, these, all these connections going back and forth. Um, and now we can start adding so, so these bigger systems, micro systems, we started getting lots of communication going back and forth um, and then to talk to each other. Um, and so once we get lots and lots of pieces, distributed pieces, which are sending data to different places, requesting data from different places, the communication gets more and more complex to keep track of and update properly. Um, so, 
you know, the major improvement is, well, have some sort of central repository that can be used to send data from one spot to the other. Um, so some, some of them could be adding data to this, this box in the middle of extracting it. Um, and then this is basically an end size end problem for the number of people who got reading and writing. Whereas um, here, um, it becomes n squared and you get so many connections going back and forth. So what this is gonna to lead to is having a streaming service. And I wanna talk about um, Kafka and Kafka does some interesting things. Um, and it's fairly popular these days. And they use a log file as a basic data structure for distributed computing. Um, and so before we talk about Kafka, we need to talk about why are they using logs? Um, and by a log, they just mean a file where um, they write at the end of the file. Um, and each record, every time you add to the file, you, you give it a record number, and that becomes your timestamp of when it was added. And the reason they do this is operating systems are very good at appending to files, right? Now, if you're dealing with a database and you want to add a record to a database, um, now you need to figure out add, add the entire row and there's an index, you have to update the indexes. And so updating a database can be an expensive operation. Taking your record and writing it to the end of a file is very, very fast. Um, and there, you know, I know in Linux, there are some very low level operations you can do to just really make that just super fast and it was really, really fast. Um, and these days, if you're using a solid state drive to write to, um, you don't have to worry about those crazy minutes just slowly spinning around and getting ahead there. It's just like, no, it's gonna be um, extremely fast to write in the file. Um, and so I've actually read people you know, saying that they should try and just use a log file as a database. So, um, and yeah, so how do we how do we make things acid or in a database? Um, you know, so what happens when some sort of SQL request comes into a database and we want to make sure that if the database goes down, we can recover that operation. Um, and so one way is you immediately write that request to the file as fast as you can, and then you basically update the database for that request, if it's the right request. Um, and then if the, the database ever crashes before it can actually do a snapshot, um, we can basically start um, scrub the database and then rerun the log file and check and see um, if all the transactions have been done. And actually, there are a lot of places now where they use what they call an in-memory database. That is, all the database files are written um, are stored in memory only, and each write request is stored in a log file. And so, if the machine goes down, the database crashes. The way we recover the database is you just you just rerun all the operations in the log file. Um, and they do this because keeping all the data in memory um, makes the operation very fast. And this is very common in the finance world because 
for them, time really is money. Um, the point where, you know, at one point there was a uh, finance company in Chicago that to gain a competitive advantage, they actually laid the fiber off the cable from Chicago to New York City because they could get a shorter cable than existed currently. And so when they made requests to the New York Stock Exchange in Chicago, it would be a few milliseconds drive faster than anyone else's in Chicago. Um, and they found it was worth expense to build what we would think as an expensive copper cable from Chicago to New York. They made their money back. Um, right, so yeah, we can use this log file as a backup. Um, Like I said, this is used by in-memory databases. Um, you basically keep all your tables in memory and when there's a write, you update, you, you send the operation right to the log file, which is very fast and you can update it in memory. Um, and then to restart, you just replay all the, all the um, operation log file. And at some point you do a snapshot and then you can Replace the log file and start over again. And okay, now um, <clears throat> what happens when <clears throat> our requests for database become um, so numerous and come so fast that? Uh, one instance of the database is not going to be fast enough. And, you know, so then what, typically what you do is, well, we have, um, you know, copies of the database. And so when requests come in, some will go to the master, some will go to the slaves. Um, but how do we make sure that um, the slaves are kept up to date? Um, and so one way of doing it is um, you have all the write requests go to master, it, it writes the log file, and then the slaves can be reading that log file and update themselves. Um, and so yeah, we can you know, start having all writes get sent to log file, and then all the client or slave databases read from it, and we can direct all the reads to those. Um, oops. Okay, here we go. Um, yeah, we like that. Um, and so we can use these log files to replicate them. This will all come together in a minute. Um, but um, now I'll go on to message systems. And if you took an operating system, I'm sure you looked at queues with producers and consumers. So producers are. Um, adding data to a queue and consumers are pulling off the other end. Um, and so we can use that in a treatment system where we have you know, a bunch of machines which are producing data. These could be you know, you, your UPS truck drivers and they scan your package to give it to you. Right, that information gets sent to a central database, right? Um, and so we get all those things we can send in the queue, and then we can have someone at the end reading off all those messages to update the database. Um,
you know, it scales well, so this thing can be really, really fast. Um, but we got more than one consumer. As soon as someone beats in the queue, the data goes away. Um, another um, system we can use is, you can see this a lot in the applications. Where we've got a publish subscribe system where when the producer produces something, it's going to broadcast that um, to all listeners. Um, and then different consumers can listen to different, broad, different producers. Um, that allows for multiple people, multiple subscribers to get the same data as everyone else. Um, but doesn't scale very well because you're broadcasting um, over and over again. You know, and we can even try and modify a test and a bus. Um, we're getting closer to all this coming together. Um, so on a message system, there are some important issues you have to worry about. One is failure. What happens when your machine that is handling your message system goes down? Um, if you're using multiple machines, then you have to worry about how do you balance the load, make sure that one machine isn't doing most of the work. Um, and you also want redundancy. We want to be able to, if one machine goes down, we don't want that information to be lost. So failures, um, you know, what happens when the publisher fails, right? So someone producing things, producing data and that and fails. Um, what happens when they send a message to the message system and the message doesn't get there? Um, you know, how do we know whether the message was ever sent or not, received or not? Um, when a consumer fails, what can happen is, oh, the reading information, they may have started the read, but then they fail. And now that information to them is lost, how do we deal with that? Um, and then the system itself, one node or machine can fail, the whole system can fail. Um, what happens then? How do we recover? So on a message system, then we can talk about the semantics of how we want it to work. Um, <clears throat> you know, one is we will send a message um, at most once, and if it gets lost, it gets lost too bad. Um, but you don't have to worry about getting a message twice. Um, so if I think of you know sending an order to sell or buy a stock. Um, we never want that to be, you know, what happened when that order gets sent, but then it's failed, somehow fails, and we resend it, then we worry about did we did buy twice as much stock as we wanted. Um, um, at least once, um, you wanna make sure it always gets there. Um, and if you have to, issue the order twice, we don't care, but we want to make sure it gets there so we reorder it. Um, and what everyone wants is they want it exactly once, right? We send the message, um, it gets there, um, and we don't have to worry about having to resend it. Um, So um, how all is tied together? 
When we talk about big data, um, the data can be big in different ways. Um, one is just this enormous amount of data. Um, another way is that the data is coming very rapidly, right? Because we're producing lots and lots of data. So if you look at like a company like UPS, um, you know, they've got how many trucks worldwide um, and they're continually scanning things um, and they're tracking where all those packages are. Um, so there's this continuous stream of data coming at them. Um, and so we want some way of handling all those inputs. You know, there, you know, these days there are multiple situations where there's, we're producing lots of data that we need to, companies need to ingest in real time. Um, and so Kafka is a system that does that. Um, it was started at Lincoln. Why? Wow, because you have this, now again, worldwide, Lincoln's got many, many users. They're continually updating their, their status. People are continually querying their status. Um, and then we start adding ads. And that, right, if all this data has been changed, um, and so they needed some way um, to handle this data going back and forth. Um, so they created um, Kafka. Um, and the reason it's called Kafka is the lead developer. There's a, there's a famous author, you know, Franz Kafka, who wrote this some very strange books. And the lead developer liked him, so he was a writer and his system dealt with writing data, so that's the name. Um, eventually they, they formed their own company and then they donated Kafka to Apache. There is um, a lot of you know, some users. The big one is Netflix. Um, you know, this information is several years old. At, this at that time, they were handling 70 billion messages a day. Um, you know, we're talking about requests for videos, uploading videos. Um, and who knows what? And they had 36 different Kafka clusters running. Um, the New York Times use it to um, publish content to their applications that people have, various systems, making articles. Um, Available to readers. There's a couple of tools that are related. Um, Apache Zookeeper is needed, um, and the KSQL is designed to stream SQL over, over Kafka. Um, Some history of Kafka. Um, you know, version one came out three years ago, but it was in production before then. And the main thing is you can publish and subscribe to streams of records. Um, I think of it as a message queue system, or enterprise messaging system, um, but it can handle a lot of throughput. Um, it stores in a fault tolerant way, so if party system goes down, um, it can recover. Um, and Kafka is run as a cluster on one or more servers. Um, the more servers you have, the more throughput you can get. Um, it allows you also to replicate the data more often, so you get from 
mine goes down. Um, <clears throat> and it stores messages in categories, what they call topics. Um, and each record consists of a key, a value, and a timestamp. And the value can be basically any, any piece of data. And the API, um, there's a producer API that allows you to push things on to uh, Kafka streams, a consumer. Um, you can subscribe to Kafka system to read topics. Um, and in between the streams, which can, right? And then you've got connectors um, which connect to um, databases, connect to presumers. And so basically, you know, you set up a Kafka cluster, um, you may have some producers, which are sending data to your cluster, um, you have a bunch of consumers which are reading from the cluster and you know database could be a consumer database could be a producer and it's possible for an application to be both a consumer and a producer um, and the cluster um, each topic has its own own queue or message system, um, and it's partitioned in different partitions, right? Different machines. Um, So a topic is this way to categorize messages. So you can have, we don't have one, not every message has to go into the same stream. Um, and it can be spread across multiple partitions. And a partition is just a log of the records for the topic. Um, and they're stored on disk, not in memory. Um, and records are given an ID, um, and each partition is a different machine, and each partition is replicated on different machines. So if one machine goes down, the other machine can take up the task of dealing with that. Um, particular operation. Um, And as records are written to the stream, retain for a fixed amount of time, and you can figure that. So it's so different consumers can read the same topic and get the same information. Um, so if we don't delete them after we, after a read. Um, however, once the timeout period ends up, they will start deleting um, records so they don't consume entire disk space. Um, and the nice thing is basically the performance doesn't suffer um, <clears throat> given the number of records you have on a single partition because again we're writing in one end and reading from another end. Um, And for each consumer, there's a there's an offset for that consumer. So when a consumer reads, um, he always starts from where they left off. Um, and the consumer can actually control it offset, so then they go back, they can re um, So it means that each consumer has their own 
bot in the queue or this message system and Yeah, each copy right um each server will have their own set of partitions that they'll deal with. Um, so even if you only have two machines, you can have multiple partitions. Um, and for each partition, there is a machine that's dedicated to leader. And when the leader fails, then a follower um, becomes a leader. Um, and publishers figure um, are going to produce data. Again, this could be UPS guy scanning in um, locations of you know, a package, or it could be a cash register sending data. Um, to Walmart Central Database, um, and they can choose um, there may be for each topic in multiple uh, partitions. And so, how do we can slide? We can just do something to Ron Robin, um, or we can do a selection by key. Um, so we'll assign certain keys to different. Um, Partitions. To get rapid throughput, um, consumers can be grouped into, can be grouped. Um, and you give each consumer the same group name. Um, and then you can have multiple consumers in that group reading um at the same time and within that group the data will not be duplicated so again we can have yeah they really designed this for maximum throughput uh, both at the consumer producer level and shove things to different partitions um the cluster itself has multiple part we divide things into different Topics and each topic is partitioned different machines. Um, so they make certain guarantees. Um, messages from the same producer always are sent. In the order. They're always ordered and sent in order they were sent. Um, and the consumer will always see the records in that same order. Um, and if you have a replication factor of n, then um, we can tolerate a failure of up to n minus one servers without losing any records. And yeah, there's um, different partitions of the same topic. Um, they're not ordered, so um, you know. So the situation is, the producer sends one message to partition A, uh, the same topic, and sends it to partition B, the same topic. Coffee doesn't worry about whether. Um, Message one, message two came in what order? Um, it's only per partition that they keep track of the order. So, example of usage is well. Um, Got a web server and um, is grabbing data from different producers. 
right? Um, my forget your messages into our message system. Um, now I'm going to read the information from the logs or from the server. Um, you know, we can right, read different partitions from groups. And if we need strict ordering of the messages, we can just create one partition for the topic. Um, so I did a test on Kafka. Um, and they use you know some old machines that are sitting around. Um, And with one producer, um, they were able to um, push through 800,000 records per second. Um, with three producers, um, they will produce 2 million records per second to the system. You know, so they, they're able to use this um, as very through high pitch. Um, to show that didn't matter how much data was in the system. Um, you know, here's a throughput per second. And here's how much data um, they had. And as you can see, it, um, there's basically no degradation um, from 200 gigabytes to 1,400 gigabytes. Consumer throughput. Um, and they're able to, with three consumers, right, read again two million records per second. And then latency, um, they achieve two milliseconds median um, from producer to consumer. Um, 99% of them went through in three milliseconds. Oops. So we have a lot of data being moved around um, different places. Um, Kafka is a very common system to use now. Um, You know, it's quite fast because we get concurrent reads and writes to the same topic. Um, and we store things in binary, so we copy just the you know, bits. Right, and they, um, they're basically writing it just directly, they're avoiding dealing with the JVM. Um, so yeah, if you look at the, and this is 
whenever you start to scale up, um, you start paying attention to lots of the details that you normally don't worry about. Um, this is one of them, right? So if You know, we want to send debt, right? When we're dealing with data on a network, right? Um, you, know, we, you know, if I got, up, if I got um, you know, how does a an application get data from a network and vice versa? Well, that's go from the network from the kernel space to the user space has to come off the network card, right? Um, and so the data is copied many times. Um, right. Um, so we want to read it. It's like, well, we first read, the, read it on disk. We, pay, we get a copy of the page in kernel space. Um, and then the application has to copy from kernel space to user space. Um, now send out the network. He has to again, copy it from user space to the socket buffer. And then the OS copy the socket buffer to the NIC buffer and sends it out. Um, on Linux, we've got send file. And you can actually directly send data from the disk into the NIC buffer. Um, And so they've, they've optimized a lot of low level stuff so it works very, very fast. How they guarantee delivery? Um, now, first the producer sends a message, right? Um, the follower, you know, the message is then sent from the master to the server. Um, right. You know, so when the master gets a message back from the from its followers that is they've written it, um, that's when we consider it delivered. Um, Right. Um, so what happens when the producer dies? And so producers know it, right, um, exists. Uh, and the server may then re re try and resend it. Um, Kafka now keeps track of that. Um, And each producer will, has a sequence number and an ID, so Kafka will, will check for duplications. Um, so Kafka, um, you know, the way of handling transferring data, not as a batch job, but as a streaming service data streaming in and out. Um, again, you think of you know, big companies like Walmart trying to keep track of inventory worldwide. Um, you know, Walmart was one of the first companies that really leveraged software to um, scale up. And so the inventory system is one of their secret weapons. They know at all times what's in the inventory, what has been sold. And so basically all their storage, all their cash registers are sending data um, and streaming in constantly. Um, and so how do we how do we deal with these streams of data coming in? And 
Kafka is one common system that's used now. It's not as sexy as using Spark, um, but it's one aspect of big data that um, has to be addressed when you start getting um, large streams of data. Um, let's see, questions. So the question is how are topics and partitions related? Um, a topic is divided into different partitions. So when a producer writes to a topic, um, some messages are with different partitions. Um, Now, if you really want all messages in a topic to be sequenced properly, then we only have one partition. Um, but again, if you look at, you know, think of the UPS example, um, you probably don't care that all messages that are being scanned from scanning packages come in in the exact same order. Um, so we can, you know, create multiple partitions for that. Kafka does not use the observer pattern. Um, the observer pattern pushes, when, when the data changes, the observer pattern will push it out to the clients or the observers. Um, Kafka does not do that. Um, producers will write to a, a topic in a particular partition. Um, and clients will then read, make a re explicit request to read a piece of data from the partition, right? With Observer, you can think of it as a push model. It pushes the data out to the people who want it. Um, and Kafka is more of a pull model. So the people who want the data have to go and pull it out of the Kafka system. Does that explain the last two questions? Okay. Well, I think that is all I have for today. Well, we can find it. Um, you know, there, there's a system they use to actually when the master goes down, how do you figure out which follower or slave takes over? Um, so they've got an algorithm to deal with that. And there's a, um, they use Zookeeper to keep track of that. And the Zookeeper will then determine who, who becomes the next leader. Um, yeah. And it's like Spark, um, you can download Kafka to a laptop and run the laptop, play with it. I've done that. Um, so we're out of time. Um, so I'll end here and we'll see everyone again on Thursday.